Hi, this is the first of three mini lectures in the module Determining Instructional Goals, CLE, KC's, and Bloom's Taxonomy. We're going to focus in this mini lecture on the backwards design element of determining instructional goals and do so with an example of research on learning the logo programming language. This is associated with the reading by Clar and Carver, which you should do before listening to this lecture. And more specifically, the learning objective for this mini lecture is that you'll be able to explain backward design and the interrelationships between goals, assessment, and instruction, and exemplify those using the logo debugging example by Clar and Carver. So backward design is a method of designing educational curriculum, uh, curricula by setting goals before choosing instructional methods and forms of instruction. So the typical approach is to start by identifying desired results, those are your goals, determine acceptable evidence that you could observe as to whether students are achieving those goals, and that uh, will be assessments. What would you see? in student behavior that would convince you that they've achieved the goals you're after, uh, and that'll help you design assessments. And then third, instruction, plan learning experiences that support students uh, and instruction to help them learn. So the motivation for backward design is well expressed by this quote from a paper way back in 1976 by Jim Greeno. The explicit statement of instructional objectives based on psychology theory should have beneficial effects both in design of instruction and assessment of student achievement. The reason is simple. We can generally do a better job of accomplishing something and determining how well we have accomplished it when we have a better understanding of what it is we are trying to accomplish. Actually, nice piece of wisdom applies more generally, I think, to life, uh, any kind of design, not just educational design. My view on this is somewhat different from what's illustrated in this prototypical figure of backward design, which suggests that you always start with the goals and then write assessments and then write your instruction. My view is that doing all three of these in a coordinated way is the most important thing, and that iterating between them is uh, going to be more effective and more valuable than trying to get all the goals right before you make any assessments, and then write all your assessments before you design any instruction. So you could start anywhere. So could you think of reasonable ways to use one, two, and three as an example of how you could start anyway, where, and iterate. In these questions in general, in these mini lectures, I would recommend that you pause the video and see if you can answer the question before going on. So if you're coming back from a pause, I hope you thought of something like this. Here's an example sequence, two, one, two, three, one, two, starting with assessment development or selection. You know, it, sometimes you have resources that were from which there are already uh, assessments available. I certainly find that I can often better say what I'd like to see students be able to do than I can describe that in general terms. And though that description in general terms is the goal specification. So it's sometimes easier to collect some examples of behaviors, acceptable evidence you're after first, uh, and then try to express what those behaviors are indications of. As you're specifying those goals, you might realize that you have some goals for which you haven't found any assessment examples. So now you do some assessment redesign to address the goals that weren't getting addressed in your first collection. Then maybe you start instructional design, maybe even delivery, you get some results and you might revisit the goals and revisit the assessments. So that's more of an agile design approach to backward design. Next question for you, how is backward design implemented in our e-learning design big picture that you've seen in previous modules. In other words, where do these three steps of backward design align with the pieces of this image? I hope that's reasonably straightforward because the words here, goal, 
assessment and instruction are uh, the same words. But again, I want to emphasize that setting goals before um, is not the key idea. And even our big picture by having goals on the left seems to suggest that. Uh, but you might start, for example, with an initial course that you want to improve. And maybe you have data from that uh, course that you can gain some insights on and that might make you reflect on what your goals should be. And maybe that's a course that doesn't actually have explicit learning objectives or, or goals. Uh, so adding goals to an existing instructional design is indeed another way to start. It is hard to do precise goal setting and we'll talk more about how to, to do that. It is also the case that by creating assessments, it can help you clarify the goals. So if you're having trouble precisely stating goals, just go ahead and create some assessments and then come back and help and try to precisely state what the goals are. Task assessment data can change your goals. You might, for example, find that students are struggling on something you didn't even know was an issue for them and you may as a consequence add a new learning goal to address that struggle that you're observing. So a model of underlying knowledge goals is a critical piece of doing this in, in a rigorous and powerful way. And one related question here is, are learning objectives that we write down on paper, are they the same as what appears in the student's mind as they learn it? Or to say it another way, is it sufficient to read an instructional objective or a learning objective on paper and then you know it? Is that what it's for? And is that how learning is achieved? You can think of this more broadly with respect to these phrases that we're using, and sometimes they get used roughly synonymously, and sometimes they get used to enhance a description of some important nuance and sudden subtlety. So which of these things, uh, phrases, do you think is the same? Instructional goals and learning objectives, learning objectives and desired knowledge components, desired knowledge components, and a cognitive model of expertise. A uh, cognitive model of expertise is what we're going to talk more about as we get into the next unit on cognitive task analysis. Um, so if that phrase sounds new, uh, not a surprise, but we will use it more frequently. So pause the video and think about your answers to this. Can you think of any reason to distinguish between these four terms? or are they all the same? I would say for the most part, the first two are, are pretty highly similar. Sometimes instructional goals are more broad and learning objectives are somewhat more specific. And similarly, the last two are uh, similar, um, highly similar and distinguishable from the first two, which I'll say in a moment. Uh, one nuance between desired knowledge components and cognitive model of expertise is that specification of knowledge components is sometimes done in a more, in a less fully specified, less rigorous way, whereas cognitive model of expertise really suggests a pretty precise and complete indication of what are the desired knowledge components and maybe even how they interact and function together. So summarizing this. These are same for most purposes, though some use of objectives be, may be more specific than goals. And learning better focuses on the student as uh, the audience than instructional. And of course, you could say learning goals or instructional objectives as well. Those are pretty much the same. Uh, these two learning objectives and desired knowledge components are similar, but usually there are multiple knowledge components for each learning objective. In other words, the desired knowledge component is uh, at a finer grain. And components are more specific about the mental or cognitive processes involved. And really they are, as we'll note in the CLE framework, uh, about what desired change we want inside of the student's mind. Whereas a learning objective is something we write down in English to describe what we want to have happen in the mind. These uh, last two, for most purposes, they're pretty similar, although often a cognitive model has more detail, such as specifying the cognitive process in like an if-then rule form. And we'll see examples later in the cognitive task analysis unit. 
on those kinds of if-then specifications of knowledge components. So you read about the logo redesign in the Clar and Carver paper, and in particular, it's a great illustration of using backward design to design some pretty novel instruction, which uses learning to program in this logo language as a way to teach kids more generally about how to troubleshoot. So in that paper, I'd like you to reflect on how each of the elements above is reflected in the process in the paper. So how did they do goal setting? How did they do assessment task design, etc.? Did they collect data? Did they have models and insights? How did they do their instructional design? They make this general statement about the process. Uh, if the domain is properly analyzed, if instruction is based on the formal analysis, and if assessments of both what is learned in the base domain and what is transferred to more remote domains are also grounded in the formal analysis, then a powerful idea like debugging can be taught and can have an impact on general problem solving capacities. So that packs a lot in that statement. If the domain is properly analyzed, if the instruction is based on the formal analysis, how does that map into the diagram above? So insight and model are outcomes of an analysis. So there's a mapping there. Um, models are a way of, of communicating a formal analysis. If assessments of both what is learned in the base domain, so now they're talking about learning in logo, what is learned is a specification of the knowledge that's acquired in the student's mind, and what is transferred to more remote domains. So how does what is acquired in the mind carry over from logo to other troubleshooting areas? If you can be more specific about what those troubleshooting skills are, you're more likely to be able to teach towards them. A powerful idea like logo can be taught and can have a real impact. So here are those mappings of those terms uh, to the diagram uh, using color here. If the domain is properly analyzed, that's an analysis is using theory to come up with a model, perhaps informed by data, although not always. We'll call that rational or theoretical cognitive task analysis uh, later. If instruction is based on the formal analysis, so that's the link between the, the results of the formal analysis are the models and insights, and the design is based on it, that's, that's that trend. If assessments of both what is learned in the base domain and what is transferred to the more remote domain are also grounded in the formal analysis. Also my circles are, I'm now circling the line between the formal analysis in turn, which is reported in a model or a set of insights and the assessment. Those blocks should probably also be circled, but there's not good space for it. Yeah, so this paper, this work is a great example of the process that uh, I hope you are going to better and better learn and understand in this course. The detailed task analysis of logo debugging skills is a form of rational cognitive task analysis, uh, which we'll discuss in more detail. And that's drawn from theory and in some cases experience in doing this kinds of analysis. It's the basis of all the subsequent debugging instruction and learning assessment and transfer assessment. So they put a lot of stock in their theoretical uh, task analysis. So the analysis now in green indicating the link was intended to capture in the form of a concrete model. So they're creating a model, the decision processes, knowledge and subskills. By the way, in the CLE framework, decision processes, knowledge, and subskills are all kinds of knowledge components. And decision processes and subskills are also knowledge components. The analysis was intended to capture in the form of a concrete model, the decision processes, knowledge, and subskills necessary for efficient debugging of logo graphics and list processing programs with one or more semantic or syntactic bugs. So that's a uh, a specification in the paper of how they use the analysis to create a model and what that model is capable of saying about the cognitive processes of finding 
semantic or syntactic bugs in a programming language like Logo, in, in code written in a programming language like Logo. The paper also illustrates a, a more empirical or data-based cognitive task analysis. So note, cognitive task analysis is producing the model in, in both of these cases, but in the prior case, the model was being produced through a theoretical analysis, and here we're talking about using data. Uh, the paper says, the primary goal of assessing skill acquisition and transfer is to understand the detailed mechanisms and internal structures of the cognitive processes. That's the model. What are the mechanisms and internal structures of the cognitive processes involved? Several methods were used to ensure the collection of data, circled in red above, right, that would facilitate this understanding. Students were encouraged to think aloud this is one of the empirical cognitive task analysis uh, methods you'll learn about in a later module so that goals, strategies, and knowledge influencing their solutions could also be recorded. In other words, when you watch somebody solve a problem, you just see their actions. But when you ask them to think aloud, you might hear them expressing some of their goals, strategies, and retrieval of relevant prior. In this case, it would be more explicit knowledge. So in this paper, essentially we're moving from the right to the left here. Here are elements of a cognitive task analysis result. So what does the model that they created look like? Um, they describe it as having five phases. Uh, there are the five phases of the debugging process, program evaluation, bug identification, program representation, bug location, and the, this fifth one that keeps getting covered up by this darn thing that keeps popping up. I wonder if I get rid of that. So uh, this is how they visualize their model in a goal structure uh, that has a bug identification phase number two over here. Well, at the whole, the program evaluation in general is being broken down here into steps. So there's a phase of evaluating the program by testing it and seeing whether it's getting right, right results. And in the case that it isn't a phase of identifying the bug, that it's a somewhat further elaborated in the rest of the paper of representing the program, locating the bug, and correcting the bug. The elements of, of the logo example that uh, talk about goals, goals to assess transfer of debugging in particular, because that was their big, big effort is to that produce transfer of the debugging, or I referred to it as troubleshooting skills earlier. How does that transfer? What is that goal? The goal of the transfer assessment is to discover whether the knowledge elements acquired from the debugging instruction can be applied in new instances. And that was their instructional design goal as well as their research goal. They wanted to create instruction that was going to produce student competence, student knowledge components that are of a general enough character that they would work to debug in new instances. Our model provides a basis for making specific predictions about transfer effects. So again, they're referencing their model. And for choosing tasks where debugging skills are likely to be useful, that's a mapping from the model to assessment design. And they selected uh, or created three types of non-computer transfer tests that were designed, and they were able to design them well because they had this model, right? And this is a case where you, I hope you see uh, as we're going through the process they went through, that they are not going left to right, that they're iterating uh, around these loops. So they applied some theory, created some models, went to goal setting, then went back to assessment design. These three types all involved detection and correction of errors elements of the model in a set of written instructions about how to achieve a well-specified goal. So here's an example of their, one of their assessment designs, quite clever. By the way, if if you are at CMU or uh, coming to CMU in the future, uh, Sharon Carver is a faculty member here and she teaches a great related course on goals, assessment, and instruction. She was the second author of this paper. So Sharon Carver and David Klar, who's also here at the Carnegie Mellon uh, University Psychology Department, I think created a really clever assessment here for seeing if students who learned debugging in the 
programming lang language logo could apply the same debugging skills to a task like this, which are directions for movers to place furniture in a house. And note their directions have a hierarchical structure like programs often do, like these would be different subroutines or different methods in a larger program that would call these three methods. And the key uh, goal here is to understand why the arrangement that the movers produced down here is not the arrangement that Mrs. Fisher wanted. What's wrong with the directions such that if you notice what's going on here, what's the error? See if you can figure out what the error is. They're supposed to, of course, identify that, but more importantly, find where in these instructions this error occurs and then change or add one thing to fix these directions. This assessment, again, was designed by having a model of the knowledge that they wanted students to acquire and be able to transfer across these very different settings. So did you find it? You notice the little, I guess that's like a coffee table, we would say in English, is in the wrong place. It's supposed to be here, but it ended up being here. And this is the particular location where the directions are rather vague. Put the coffee table between the two chairs. You might fix it by saying, put the coffee table between the two chairs on the wall that is opposite of the big table, or on the south wall would probably be a better way to say it. So um, this paper also provides a, a nice illustration of going from model to instructional design. These steps in our big picture on the left here in the red box is the model. And this is an actually pretty similar structure, but written in a little bit more kid language that was actually communicated to the kids as a chart in the classroom and through discussions around it that the teacher had with students. And one of their very important points is that just by programming, you don't get this just by learning to program, you don't necessarily, or experiencing programming, you don't get this transfer. There was a debate in the literature around whether simply using logo would be enough to create so-called mind storms. But what Clar and Carver argued, and I think well demonstrated, is that you don't get those mind storms unless you, you have some good instruction, uh, some guidance, so to connect back to the textbook. Uh, this is an approach of, for guided discovery. The discovery part is learning to program in Logo and, and having debugging experiences in Logo, but the guidance is to have some fairly explicit or more direct instruction around what the process of debugging is. Um, if, the, if it's not right, ask yourself, what's the problem? Does the program have sub-programs? And of course, this could be instruction if you wanted to do the instructions, have sub-instructions. Then use the information to find the bug, right? Where might the bug be? Um, you can use information from what's not right to help you find where it is. If you can't use that hierarchical information, maybe you have to read every command and decide whether it's correct. But hopefully, you can zero in using the hierarchical structure. Once you've found the bug, ask yourself, what should the fix be? Then make the fix, right? That's what they taught. So here are some further questions about the logo instructional design. Which parts of the model go with which parts of curriculum? In other words, how do they align? How do the parts of the model align with the parts of the instructional design? How do you imagine the elements of the curriculum were implemented? Did they give this chart? Did they tell students the steps? Did they show examples of these steps? Did they give practice tasks that give students practice in employing those steps? Is the instruction expressed to promote generalization and transfer? How so? What would be an example? When I said maybe it should say instruction rather than program, that would be an example of, of a slight change in the instruction that might promote better generalization and transfer. Uh, but you can reflect on whether in this, uh, whether the instructional design in the prior slide uh, achieves these things and feel free to ask questions in office hours if you don't feel you have great answers to these questions. So that concludes this mini lesson. Hope it's helpful. Ask us questions 
about it, particularly after you've done the online questions.